Hello, I'm Michelle Crummel, and I'm going to be working through a Practice Calculus BC exam with you. This will be a 40-minute exam, so it is under the new 2020 format, and if you'd like to try the exam on your own first before going through the solutions with me, click on the link in the description below. For this first question, we're given a graph, and we're told let v of t equal f prime of t be the velocity of a particle moving along a horizontal line. And so we know that we are dealing with horizontal motion here. With position x of t equals f of t feet at time t minutes. The graph of v of t shown below is differentiable for all values of t greater than 0. And we're also told that the bounded regions b and c have areas of 8 and 6 respectively. So region b has an area of 8 and region C has an area of 6. At time t equals a, the position of the particle is 3. Find the position of the particle at time t equals 4a minutes. So we're going to set up an integral to help us find this. We want the position of the particle, and that is the function x of t, at time t equals 4a. We know the position at time a, we want the position at time 4a. So we're going to start with the position at the time we know. The position is 3 at time a, and then we're going to integrate from that time a to our ending time 4a. And we're integrating v of t dt. When we integrate the velocity, we get the net distance traveled. And so to calculate that net distance, we're going to go back to the graph where we've labeled the areas. And because we're integrating from a to 4a, that means that we are looking for this area. But we have to remember that the definite integral is going to give us signed area or net area. So the uh, region b is actually going to have an area of negative 8 plus, and then the region C will have an area of positive 6. And we add these values together and we get 1. So the position of the particle at time t is 1 foot. For part b, we're told if the integral of v of t dt from 0 to 4a is equal to the sum from 0 to infinity of 5 fourths times negative 2 thirds to the n, find the distance traveled by the particle from time t equals 0 to t equals a minutes. The distance traveled by the particle from 0 to a. So let's shade the part of the graph that we're looking for here. We're looking for the area of this region right here. That would represent the distance traveled from time t equals 0 to time t equals a. Now the sum that we have on the right side of our equation is a geometric series, and it's a convergent geometric series. I know that it's a convergent geometric series because the common ratio, or that r value, is between negative 1 and 1. So this is a convergent geometric series, and that means that I can use the formula for finding the sum of a geometric series. And that sum would be a sub 1, the first term in the series, over 1 minus r, the common ratio. So to find a sub 1, we want to pay attention to the index of our summation. It starts at n equals 0. And if I let n equal 0, if I sub in 0 for n, into our formula here, we're just going to get 5 over 4. And so that is my a sub 1. It's 5 over 4 over 1 minus, and the r value is negative 2 thirds. Make sure you keep that negative with your value of r. So this now becomes 5 over 4 over 1 plus 2 thirds, which is 5 over 4 over 5 over 3 which is 3 fourths. So now we know that the integral from 0 to 4a of v of t dt is equal to 3 fourths. And that helps us because the integral from 0 to 4a would be the net distance traveled. And so let's go back to the graph and shade what that would represent. So I'm going to switch colors for the part that is below the x-axis here, region B. 
and then we have this part above the x-axis region C. And so the integral from 0 to 4a, v of t dt, is going to be the area for region A minus the area for region B, treat that as a negative 8, and then plus the area of region C. Okay, so then the integral from 0 to a, v of t dt, minus 8 plus 6 is equal to 3 fourths. And so the integral from 0 to a, v of t dt, will equal, if I rearrange terms here, I'm going to be adding 2 to both sides, it'll be 2 and 3 fourths, or 11 over 4. And that would represent the distance traveled from time 0 to time a. The next part of this question says, use your answer from part b to find the total distance traveled from time t equals 0 to the time when the particle first changes direction from left to right, and then justify your response. So on our graph, we can see the point where the particle first changes direction from left to right as the place where the velocity first changes from negative to positive. And that occurs at this point right here. The velocity is negative until t equals 3a, and then it's positive after t equals 3a, right? It's changing from being negative to being positive. So we want to find the total distance traveled from time t equals 0 to time t equals 3a. And to do that, we want the integral from 0 to 3a of the absolute value of v of t dt. But we're working for, from a graph, so we'll just have to think about what that means to integrate the absolute value of the function. Well, it means that our positive area here is going to remain a positive area, and we calculated that in part a as 11 over 4. But then it means also here that this uh, area that we were treating as negative a moment ago, we're going to think of as positive area now as well, so that we can get the total area. So this is just going to be 11 over 4 plus 8. And we can leave our answer like that, but if you want to simplify that, 8 and 11 over 4 would be 32 plus 11, so 43 over 4 feet. The next part tells us that the volume of the solid on the interval from 0 to a is exactly 6. Use this information to find the integral of f of t from 0 to a. Write your answer in terms of a. And we have some different information at the top as well. The region between the graph f prime of t, so that's our graph that we were just thinking about as velocity a moment ago. Now we're just thinking of it as a function f prime of t. So the region between this function and the t-axis, and the t-axis is just uh, what you'd normally think of as the x-axis there. So the region between the graph and the t-axis is the base of a solid whose cross sections perpendicular to the t-axis form rectangles with height 3t. So I'm going to do my best attempt to draw a diagram here il illustrating what this might look like. We, are, we have to think of this, of what we're seeing on the graph right now, as a top-down view. And the region between t equals 0 and t equals a is like the base of our solid. Okay, We're going to ignore the rest of the graph. We're just working on this part of the graph right here. That's the base of our solid. And then what makes it three-dimensional here, I guess, is... This is, remember, it's a top-down view. So we've got this part of the graph that's coming up towards us, like right off the page towards us in the shape of a rectangular. If we were to make a, a slice, just like I've kind of drawn here, a slice down the solid and look at it from a side view, we would see a rectangle. So it is a little difficult to draw in two dimensions, but I'm gonna do my best here. To, if you would imagine like a rectangle coming up towards you and it's got a little bit of thickness to it 
like so. Okay, so we've got this rectangular prism um, coming up from that region. And then there are a bunch of other ones as well. Um, you know, they're all, they're all kind of stacked up here. And we are trying to find the total volume of this solid. Okay, so let's read through the question again and see what information we have about this. The um, base is perpendicular to the t-axis, so we know that. The rectangle has a height of 3t. Okay, so this distance along this side right here is 3t. That is the height of our rectangle. And then the thickness of this rectangular prism is just our, normally I would say dx, but it's a t-axis here. So this little thickness right here is dt. And then we need an expression for the base right here. What is that distance there? Well, that is a vertical distance. And to get vertical distance, you take the y value for the top of your region and then subtract the y value at the bottom of your region. So we'll do top minus bottom there, which is the function of the graph that we're looking at, f prime of t, and at the bottom it's touching y equals zero. So that distance right there is just f prime of t. So the volume of one of these rectangular prisms would be f prime of t times 3t times dt. And that just represents one cross section. And we want to add up all of the cross sections. So we're going to integrate to do that from t equals 0 to t equals a. And that's going to give us the volume of our solid. OK, so how are we going to integrate 3t f prime of t dt from 0 to a? Well, thinking about our integration techniques, here we can use integration by parts. And it's a little unclear, you know, maybe what you should choose for your u, what you should choose for your dv, because we don't know what kind of function we have, although we could make a guess based on what the, the graph looks like. Um, but if we do go with the 3t as our u for this problem, because that is a polynomial, we could use tabular method. Tabular method is a huge time saver when you're doing integration by parts, especially if you get a problem where you have to do repeated integration by parts. Now in this one, um, because the u is just, you know, involves t to the power 1, we're not going to have to do repeated parts. But let's just review the tabular method in case you're not used to using that method. I think it really will save you some time. So you let your u equal 3t in this case, and we're going to let the dv equal f prime of t. So we're going to keep taking the derivative of our u until we get 0. The derivative of 3t is 3. The derivative of 3 is 0. And then we're going to integrate our dv. So the integral for f prime of t is just going to give us f of t. And then the integral of f of t, that's not that easy to write. So we're just going to write integral of f of t dt from 0 to a. Now with tabular method, you do have to remember which part to add, which part to subtract, and the signs alternate. So on the top row there, I'm going to leave it positive. The second row, I'm going to be multiplying by negative 1, and the next row, I would make it positive. If I had more rows than what you see here, I would keep alternating the sign like that. Then we're going to set up our answer. We're going to multiply diagonally like so. OK, so this volume will be 3t f of t minus 3 times the integral from 0 to a f of t dt. Now this is all part of our definite integral that we started with. So even this part here that doesn't no longer has an integral uh, symbol in front of it, we still have to evaluate that on our interval from 0 to a. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll sub in the upper limit of integration a. We get 3a f of a minus, then we sub in our lower limit of integration, 3 times 0 times f of 0 is just going to give us 0. So then we've got minus 3 times the integral from 0 to a, f of t dt. And remember what we're trying to do with this question. We are trying to 
find this integral. So it's okay that we don't know how to integrate that. We just need to isolate that term on one side of our equation because we are also told here in the problem that the volume is equal to six. So now I can say that this is all equal to six, like so. I also know the value of f of a, and we found that earlier in the problem. Let me go back. And we can get that from this part of the problem right here where it says at time t equals a, the position of the particle is three. Now we were told that x of t equals f of t. And so the position function in this case also represents our f of t function. So we can say that f of a in this case is equal to three. So now we have six equals nine a minus three times our integral. And we wanna, like I said, isolate that integral. We can also divide everything by three here, um, but our integral would be nine a, if we're just rearranging terms, we move the, or add the three times the integral to both sides, then divide everything by three, subtract the six. So we've got our integral f of t dt equals 9a minus 6 over 3, positive 3. Yes, and then we can simplify that and we get 3a minus 2. The next part of the problem says the function g of x is defined as follows. g of x equals the integral from 0 to x over 2 f prime of t dt. Find g prime of 2a and g double prime of 2a in terms of a. Does the graph of g have a relative minimum, a relative maximum, or neither at x equals 2a? And give a reason for your answer. So in order to find g prime and g double prime at 2a, we first have to find those things in terms of x. So we have the equation for g of x. Let's find an equation for g prime of x. And to do that, we are going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus. To take the derivative of the integral, we're going to substitute the upper limit of integration in for the t, so that's going to give me f prime of x over 2. And then chain rule, I'm going to multiply by the derivative of x over 2, which is going to give me 1 half, like so. Now I can find g prime of 2a. g prime of 2a would be 1 half f prime of, and then 2a divided by 2 would just be a, f prime of a. Well, we have the graph of f prime of t, and so f prime of a would just be the y value when t equals a. So that's equal to 1 half times 0, or zero. So g prime of 2a equals zero. Now let's find g double prime of x. And to find g double prime of x, we're going to take the derivative of g prime of x. So g double prime of x would be one half, that's a constant multiple, so it stays in the derivative. And then we need to use chain rule to take the derivative of f prime of x over two, that's f prime of stuff. So it's going to be f double prime of stuff times the derivative of the stuff. Okay, so that would simplify to 1 fourth f double prime of x over 2. And then we want g double prime of 2a. So 1 fourth f double prime of a. Now we have the graph of f prime, and we want to find the value of f double prime at a. So the same point, t equals a, what is the slope of this graph? Because this is the f prime graph. So if we're wondering about f double prime, we're thinking about the slope of this graph that we're looking at. And we don't know the numeric value, but we do know that it's negative. If we were to draw a tangent line at t equals a, it would have a negative slope. 
So we can say that this value is negative. So if you look at the rest of what we have to do in this problem, that's really all that we need to know because we're trying to determine if G has a relative min, a relative max, or neither at x equals 2a. So let's use the clues that we have found so far. The first derivative of g at 2a equals 0, and that means that 2a is a critical value. It's a critical value for g. And if it's a critical value, it could potentially be a relative max or min. So now we look at the second derivative. The second derivative is negative at x equals 2a, which indicates that the original graph of g, not the graph that we're looking at here, but just g, is concave down. And so if we know that at x equals 2a we have a critical value and the graph is concave down, then it's got to look something like that at that point. And that tells us that we have a relative max. So this is called the second derivative test for extrema. Now let's write out our conclusion. So we want to make sure that we name our functions. Don't just say it or the function or the graph or anything vague like that. Always name your function. So we'll say g has a relative maximum. Be specific at x equals 2a since, and then explain how we know, g prime of 2a, don't need the extra parentheses there, don't know why I did that, equals 0 and g double prime of 2a is less than 0. And that's all the explanation we need to give there. Next, write but do not evaluate an expression involving one or more integrals that gives the perimeter of region B. So let's shade region B so we're clear what we're looking for here, region B. And when it says perimeter, we know that we need to find the length of all of the sides. I guess sides isn't a very good word to use here. Um, but we need to find the, the complete perimeter on the outside. So I am going to, I guess, just color what we're looking for. So we want this whole length here, this arc length, plus we also want this length right here. Okay, so the top piece of that region, it's linear and it's easy to find that length, right? It just goes from A to 3A, it's horizontal, so that is just a distance of 2A. So the perimeter will be 2A plus, and then we need to use an integral to find the arc length from A to 3A. So we'll integrate from t equals a to t equals 3a. And remember your formula for arc length. So square root of 1 plus the derivative of the function you're finding the arc length of. And we're finding the arc length of f prime of t. This is already the graph of f prime of t. So we have to take the derivative of that, which would be f double prime of t. And you have to square your derivative. So be careful there because if you have your formula written down and if you're referencing some kind of formula sheet, normally it would say 1 plus f prime squared under the square root, and that's because you would be finding the arc length of the function f. But here we're finding the arc length of the function f prime, so we have to take the derivative of f prime, and that's why we have f double prime under the square root in our formula here. And that's it for that problem. We don't have to go any further than that. Moving on to question number two. In question number two, we're given a table. So we're told for x values greater than or equal to zero, y equals f of x represents the particular solution of a logistic differential equation. So the differential equation is dy dx equals f prime of x. So it's just different notation we can use for our different differential uh, equation. And we're also told that the particular solution here has a carrying capacity of 60, and that f of 0 equals 5. Well, we can see that f of 0 equals 5 from the table, but f of 0 equals 5 gives us our initial condition, and we also have our carrying capacity. So we know in general what the shape of this solution looks like. The 
solution is a logistic curve. And so it's going to, you know, do something like this. And we know there is a horizontal asymptote down here at y equals zero. And we know that we have a horizontal asymptote up here at y equals 60, that carrying capacity. And we have an inflection point exactly halfway between y equals zero and y equals 60. So this would occur at y equals 30. All right, so we might have to use some of that information on these problems. Moving along, let f of n equal a sub n for n greater than or equal to zero. Determine whether the following converge or diverge. Explain your reasoning. So first it's asking about the sequence for a sub n, the sequence a sub n. And the terms of this sequence are values of the function, f of 1, f of 2, or we would start at n equals 0, so uh, f of 0, f of 1, f of 2, etc. And so they would be points on the logistic curve that I drew at the top there. So to determine if a sequence converges or diverges, we want to know what the limit of a sub n is as n approaches infinity. If that limit is finite, then the sequence converges. If that limit is not finite, then the sequence diverges. So what is the limit of a sub n as n approaches infinity? Well, remember a sub n equals f of n. So let me just label this um, f of x, but we can also think of it as f of n. What's the limit as n approaches infinity? Well, the limit is 60, right? It's approaching that horizontal asymptote at y equals 60. And because 60 is finite, we can say that the sequence converges. Therefore, the sequence a sub n converges. Now, what about the series for a sub n summing from 0 to infinity? Well, again, we can look at the fact that the limit of a sub n as n approaches infinity is 60 to help us answer that question. If the nth term is approaching 60, then your sum is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It is not uh, settling down towards a finite value. So this diverges. Now we've been told that the nth term test for divergence is not going to be tested on this year's exam, but still a very important uh, test to remember. And we're gonna use that here. And let me go ahead and, I guess, write it as if I, you know, we're going to cite the nth term test. I would say equals 60, which is not 0. Therefore, this series diverges. We don't necessarily have to name the test, but I'm going to go ahead and do so. By the nth term test for divergence. Now remember um, that that test is only used for divergence. It cannot be used to show convergence. And we, if we um, were to say that the limit was zero, that wouldn't tell us anything about the convergence or divergence of the series. So we want to be careful there. For the next part, we're told the function g is differentiable for x greater than or equal to zero and is defined by g of x equals 4x plus the integral from zero to 2x f of t dt. Use Euler's method starting at x equals 0 with three steps of equal size to approximate g of 1.5. So we're told to start at x equals 0. I'm going to go ahead and set up a table for Euler's method. So we're going to start out with our x values. Then we need uh, lots of room to calculate our y values. And then we need a bit of space to calculate our slopes. So the x value we're starting at is 0. And we want to use three steps of equal size to get to 1.5. So how do we get to 1.5 in three steps? We'll go from 0 to 0 0.5 to 1 to 1.5. So our step size here is 0 0.5. And I don't know, let me just make a note. Normally we call the step size h, but it's not super important here. I'm just going to say step equals 0 0.5. And we'll use that in our calculation. So the initial y value will be the g of x value. So I'm just going to label that g of x. But you can also just write y there. That's OK, too. 
And to find the y value when x is 0, we're going to need to calculate g of 0. So g of 0 would equal 4 times 0, which is 0, plus the integral from 0 to 0. So really, there's not. <laughs> I keep waiting to write something down, but as soon as I see I'm integrating from 0 to 0, I know the answer is just going to be 0. right? So I'm substituting 0 in here. I get 4 times 0 plus the integral from 0 to 0. So right away, I know that that is all just going to equal 0. OK, so my g of 0 equals 0. And then we're going to calculate the slope. So for the slope, I'm going to write g prime of x. You can write dy over dx or y prime or whatever you like there. So g prime of x, now we have to find that. So we're going to look at the equation for g of x right here. And we're going to take the derivative. So g prime of x equals 4 plus, and we're using the fundamental theorem of calculus to take the derivative of the next term. We take the 2t and or the 2x and sub it in for the t, so we get f of 2x. Then multiply by the derivative of the 2x, which is 2. Okay, so our g prime of x is 4 plus 2f of 2x. Now this derivative equation doesn't have a y in it. We only need to use the x value to determine the slope. So I want to find g prime of 0, and that's going to be 4 plus 2 times f of 2 times 0 is 0, like so. And I can read f of 0 from the table, f of 0 is 5. So this would equal 4 plus 2 times 5, or uh, 14. So that's my initial slope. To find the next y value using Euler's method, we take the previous y value plus the step size times the slope from the previous step. So that's going to equal 7. And now I recalculate my slope. I don't need to use y for the slope calculation, just the x. So it'll be g prime of 0 0.5 equals 4 plus 2 times f of and then 2 times 0.5 is just 1. 4 plus 2 times f of 1. f of 1, we we'll read from the table, is 6. Times 2 is 12. Plus 4 is 16. And then I go to my next calculation for y. I take the previous y value plus the step times the previous slope. So half of 16 is 8 plus 7 is 15. And then we recalculate the slope there. So g prime of 1 equals 4 plus 2 times f of 2. 4 plus 2 times f of 2. f of 2 is 8 times 2 is 16 plus 4 is 20. And so here we've got 15 plus the step times the previous slope. 15 plus 10 is 25. So that's going to be my approximation. And I'm going to say g of 1.5 is approximately, don't use an equal sign there, this is just an approximation, is approximately 25. Part C. The function h has derivatives of all orders for x greater than or equal to 0, with h of 0 equals 10. The nth derivative of h is given by the nth derivative uh, of h at x equals f of 20 minus 2n minus 50 over e to the x. So that is the formula for finding the derivative of h. That's all that that formula is going to give us, the derivative of a, the nth derivative of h for n greater than or equal to 1. Now let p3 of x be the third degree Maclaurin polynomial for h of x. When you see Maclaurin polynomial, we know that the center is 0. If p3 of 2 equals 44 over 3, solve for p. So let's go ahead and write out the third degree Maclaurin polynomial. So we're going to use a center of 0. We know that in general, the polynomial would be h of the center, so h of 0 divided by 0 factorial times x to the power 0 plus h prime of the center, so h prime of 0 divided by 1 factorial 
times x to the power 1 plus h double prime of 0 divided by 2 factorial times x squared. And we need one more term because we're going to third degree. So h triple prime of 0 over 3 factorial times x cubed. Now let's find our coefficients using this formula that we were given. h of 0 was given to us as 10. So we know that's 10 plus. Now to find h prime of 0, we're going to come to this equation and let n equals 1. That's going to give us our first derivative of h. So when n equals 1, we get f of 20 minus 2, so f of 18 minus 50. f of 18 is 54 minus 50 is 4 over e to the power 1. No, n is 1. x is 0. Let's be careful there. n equals 1, but x equals 0 because x is our center. So we get 54 minus 50, which is 4, over e to the power 0, which is still 4. So 4 times x. OK, so let me erase this and this. And we're going to find h double prime of 0. So for h double prime, n is going to equal 2. So we want f of 20 minus 4, f of 16. f of 16 is p plus 50. Then we subtract 50, and we just have p. And it's over e to the power 0. So that's just p over 2 factorial, which is 2, times x squared. OK, now let's erase that bit. And now we want the third derivative of h. So we're going to let n equal 3. f of 20 minus 6, so f of 14, which is 46, minus 50 is negative 4, over e to the power 0 is negative 4, over 3 factorial. 3 factorial is 6, x cubed. You don't have to change the 3 factorial to a 6. You can leave it as 3 factorial if you like. All right, so that's p3 of x. And then we are told that p3 of 2 equals 44 over 3. So when we let x equal 2 in this Maclaurin polynomial, we get a result of 44 over 3. So let's do that. p sub 3 of 2 equals 10 plus 4 times 2 is 8, 4 squared no, 2 squared is 4, divided by 2 is 2, so plus 2p. And then 2 cubed is 8, times 4 is 32 over 6. And we can reduce both of those, so that would be 16 over 3. And we know that is all equal to 44 over 3. So let's do this. I'm just going to erase the front part here so it looks like a proper equation. And then let's multiply both sides by 3. And I'm just doing that because I think it'll be easier to solve without having fractions in the problem, although you could go to your calculator and solve it on your calculator. But um, I'm not going to bother getting my calculator. I'm just going to multiply both sides by 3. And that's going to give me 30 plus 24 plus 6p minus 16 equals 44. So that's going to be 54. I'm just going to rearrange terms here. So if I take that 54 and subtract it on both sides, I have negative 10 on the right. And then if I add the 16 over, my negative 10 plus 16 is going to turn into a 6. So I'll have 6p equals 6. And that means that p equals 1. All right, final part of the question. When x is greater than or equal to 0, y equals f of x is the particular solution to our logistic differential equation. dy dx equals f prime of x, carrying capacity 60, f of 0 equals 5. So um, a reminder of that again. Find the limit as x approaches infinity for f of x minus e to the negative x plus 4x all over tan inverse x plus 2x. We want to start by just thinking about what's going to happen as x approaches infinity. So 
it's not really appropriate to write f of infinity because infinity is not a number, right? But we want to think about what's f doing as x approaches infinity. And remember, f was this logistic curve that we had here. So as x approaches infinity, our logistic curve is approaching that carrying capacity of 60. So the f of x is approaching 60. And then e to the negative x would be approaching 0. e to the negative x uh, put that down here, e to the negative x, that graph looks like that, right? So as x approaches infinity, um, that function is approaching zero. And then the four times infinity, that's going to be approaching infinity. All right, so overall we're approaching infinity in our numerator. Let's see what's going on in our denominator. Tan inverse x, tan inverse x. Now that graph looks like this. And that horizontal asymptote right here is occurring at y equals pi over 2. So tan inverse x is approaching pi over 2. And then the 2 times infinity is approaching infinity. So we also have a denominator that is approaching infinity. And that means that we can use L'Hopital's rule for this problem. Now you might be able to reason out what the answer is without using L'Hopital's rule. But remember, you do have to justify your answer, clearly communicate your mathematical ideas. So if you're going to try and justify this using just uh, rates of change, relative rates of change, you want to make sure that you're explaining that properly. I think it's going to be more straightforward in this problem if we just go ahead and use L'Hopital's rule. Now in order to use L'Hopital's rule, I mean you have to justify why you're allowed to use L'Hopital's rule. So we're going to take the limit of just the numerator. This is the appropriate way to show your work for L'Hopital's rule. Take the limit of the numerator separately from the limit of the denominator, rather than saying that it's equal to an indeterminate form. This is the appropriate way to justify. Okay, so both of those limits are infinity, so we may use L'Hopital's rule. And L'Hopital's rule tells us that our original limit is equal to this other limit, where we just take the, num the derivative of the numerator over the derivative of the denominator. So let's take the derivative of our numerator. The derivative of f of x would be f prime of x. The derivative of e to the negative x, we have to use chain rule, is negative e to the negative x. So we're subtracting negative e to the negative x, and that makes that plus e to the negative x. The derivative of 4x would be just 4. Then the derivative of our denominator, the derivative of tan inverse x, 1 over 1 plus x squared, plus the derivative of 2x is 2. And then let's think about our limit again in the numerator. What is f prime approaching as x approaches infinity? Well, this is f over here. So think about your tangent lines as we uh, approach infinity. They are getting, um, the function is getting closer and closer to that horizontal asymptote and it's leveling off. So the slope is approaching zero. e to the negative x is approaching zero. And then four, of course, is just approaching four. In the denominator, 1 over 1 plus an infinitely large number squared um, is just going to be approaching 0. Right? We have 1 in the numerator, infinitely large denominator, so that's just going to be approaching 0 plus 2. And so we are ready to say that this limit is just equal to 4 over 2 or 2. And there you have it. We have worked through our practice exam. Thanks for tuning in, and I wish you the very best of luck on your exams next week.